All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started with our program today. Everybody will make their way back. And we'll, uh, our special guest today is, like I said earlier, is Dave Waldron, fire pilot extraordinaire, F 105 pilot. So, Dave, if you'll come on up. Look forward to hearing this. That we had him thought, uh, and I was I was thinking if it wasn't for you know those guys in World War II that laid it on the line and stopped Germany, where would we be today? And so you guys, there's my salute to you. And I really do. Appreciate the opportunity to come up here and, and speak to you. I just sort of ramble along. I don't have a set program. I just start talking, and whatever comes out of my mouth is what you're going to hear. Uh, if you got any questions, please just raise your hand, and we'll let answer anytime. You can. Seriously, I don't, I, I don't mind stopping, and starting, stop and start as many times as, as you all want to go. Uh, I sort of start off with one thing, and I'll come back to it in a second. I'm sure everyone in this room is quite familiar with pulling high flight. And many of you all spent a lot of time in England, you, know, you fellows in the world too. And I don't know whether you know the full background of that or not, but it was written by a young man who was 18 or 19 years old, John Leslie McGee. And he was actually an American who went to Canada, joined the RAF, and got sent to England and was flying the Supermarine Spitfire. And he was on a test top on, I guess, a, a later model of the Spitfire one day, and he went up uh, 30,000 feet or so, and his poem hit him. He started writing it, and he completed what he got on the ground. And he sent it to his parents back in the States. And, uh, let's see, I think it's three months later, he was involved in a midair and was killed. But his parents actually took the poem and he somehow knows they got in front of the Library of Congress and as the saying goes, the rest is history. Well, the reason uh, I mentioned the poem, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee and one of the local TV stations, I mean, some of you may have seen this, this rendition of High Flight you may not, I don't know. But in Nashville, one of the local TV stations, one of our three TV stations at the time, which nowadays, I mean, you can imagine just three. But they used to close out their evening broadcast at 11 o'clock. They didn't run 24-7. And so at 11 o'clock at night, this, they close out. And they had the poem, Half Life, with an F-04 in the background. And that, I guess, is somehow or another. I so said, that's what I want to do. And so everything from that point forward, uh, when I was about 15, 16 years old, was to get in the Air Force and fly a single seat flight. That was it. And my friends thought, yeah, sure. You know, you're going to get to do that. Fly single seat flyers. I probably was the least looking guy that you can imagine. That you just sort of have a, a little bit of an air about a fighter pilot. And I would probably have the least appearance of what people would envision as a fighter pilot in the world. But that's what I want to do. And so I wound up uh, going to the University of Tennessee because they had Air Force ROTC. I, like I said, I grew up in Nashville. And by the way, I do have one distinction with one of your uh, gents, Bob Hoover. He grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. And, but I went to the University of Tennessee and uh, went up, got in there, off to sea, and was in the FIP program, which was a flight indoctrination program for the guys that were going to go on and be pilots. 
And so I learned to fly up there on one of the little side strips in a, in a Super Cub and a, another airplane called a Shin, which is a, it looks like a mini T-34. It was just, it was a blast. And one day I, after I got my license, I, uh, I went in and I talked to the commander. I said, by the way, he, he brought a T-33, which was one of the first jets we had. And it was a famous cockpit, you know, one behind the other. And I got to go for a ride in the T-33. That was just the coolest thing in the world. And we went and he was doing some rolls and all this stuff. And so I just went into his office one day. I said, uh, Carl, what? You know, when we all flew and you were doing rolls, I said, how do you, how do, you do that? And he said, well, you sort of pull your nose up a little bit. And then, you know, just unload it just a little bit. And you start rolling. And it just works out. I said, okay. Well, that's... <laughs> I just said, well, this little airplane would be fun. I think I'm going to try to roll with this airplane. And so I did. And I mean, it was a blast because I went, I went, I didn't, start, I didn't go pull the nose up quite high enough. And I, I started rolling. Of course, the little airplane just got pointed straight down the ground, screaming past the red line and everything. And I started pulling. I said, wow, that's fun. <laughs> and so I got back and uh, I, uh, I wasn't the brightest came on the cake when it came to the academics and I sort of majored in social more than I did academics and so I spent a couple of extra quarters at the <laughs> University of Tennessee and to my last summer there I, I uh, we, a bunch of us were, were all finishing up fall quarter and so yeah we had a blast that was, that was probably the best summer I ever had in, in, in school and uh, so this one guy who lived in the apartment complex that I do, and he had always talked about wanting to go fly. So I said, well, let's go. So we went out there to the airport, hop in this little chin, and he's in the back seat and I'm in the front, and we take off and we're flying around, everything's fun, you know. I said, you want to see a roll? He said, yeah. Up we go. Same routine. I, I, I didn't learn the first time. Maybe pull a little bit higher. And we kept screaming out, I thought they were just a place that it's just fun, you know, pulling G's and all this stuff. And uh, I saw two of them around and I said, hey, Pat, we're going to do, we want to go to the local airport, you know, municipal airport, which was right, right there near where we were flying. And uh, he said, well, I, I said, well, Pat, did you hear me? I look back, now this is a little gross. Here's this guy, he's got this back. This. I mean, literally. His mouth's all contorted, his, his hands are locked. I said, hey, you <laughs> so, I, I made a big line back to the airport, and I, actually, I lay him down the wind, and I taxi him. I'm trying to, what am I going to tell Elmer? This is Elmer's airplane. I knew I wasn't supposed to be doing aerobatics in the airplane, because I never checked out. So I said, well, we just fly around, you know, do some tight turns and look at this. And we, we literally had to lift Pat out of the airplane and set him by a tree. <laughs> well, I never did that again. I, I, I can honestly say that. But anyway, I finished up. And so I finished up in December. And I was supposed to go to a March class. Here's where some luck that I had along the way starts creeping in. I was supposed to go to a March class at Lawton Air Force Base. And here it is December. And I mean, I'm... I'm ready to go. I'm ready to start flying airplanes. And I've done my college thing. I've got that little plaque that I put on the wall. And so I go in and talk to Ella. Ella the Wyatt again, Ella Wyatt, and say, Hey, boss, can't you get me into an earlier class? And I've done this about three times. And I went back in again. He said, Damn it, I'll do my best. I'll see what I can work out. But, the, you know, these things are printed up. How long ahead of time? You know how the system works. And I said, Well, just try. And if he didn't give you a January class. So I hit the law for him. And uh, the luck was that had I been in the class of March, there were no F-105 assignments that came down. The January class, they had six F-105s for about 225 students and they have five F-100s. They were the only 11 single seat slots that 225 kids were vying for. And I got one. And I, I remember when I was when I was there, several things happened in law, but I, I, another lucky thing that happened. 
I will never forget one day we were all down. I'm still in T-37s. So you sort of, your first thing you did was fly T-37s, and then you flew T-38s, which was a little rocket ship. And I was in the T-37 still, and the I guess base ops told all the different squadrons, hey, there's, there's a flight of 105 that's going to be coming in. They're, going, they're passing through heading west. And so all the students, of course, weren't flying on schedule. All, everybody goes out, they turn everybody loose. And these guys, the guys came in with those four thuds. And the first thing they did, they had a diamond pass right down the road, about 200 feet. And they were smoking. Everybody's eyes were out there, dude. And then they come in and land, they, they get out of there, they got their cheek suits on, they got the survival vest, and you know, they just look so cool. And they all walk in, you know, and, and we, the students are just salivating. And uh, so, then, like I said, this was when I was in 237, so I didn't have my sign on it. But that was the airplane that I wanted. And uh, so, a good friend of mine, this is another lucky part of the place that happened along the way. He was uh, in a class six months ahead of me, which means I would, I would take his place basically in the same squad. And we got to be really good friends. He was a bachelor, I was a bachelor. We hung out at the pool and chased women, wives, whomever was available at the time. And uh, we would, uh, we, well, like I said, we got to be good friends, and he got into full five. And so when he knew I was going to be taking his place, he said, David, you've got to get Chris as your instructor. That was because he was his instructor. And I said, why is that? And he said, if, if you're going to get a fighter, he's going to give you the best opportunity there is to get one. Because he will pull out of you everything you've got and then some. So I said, well, can you set it up? And he said, I'll try it. So he did. He got me. Chris is, is his instructor, I, I mean, he had three students, I was one of them. And you know, he sat down and talked to each one of us individually. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to fly fighters, I want to fly them all the time. And he said, how hard are you willing to work? And I said, whatever it takes. He said, that's a mouthful. Now, let me ask you again, how hard are you willing to work? And I said, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do, and I'll do it as hard as the best I can. He said, well, you're going to have to because the other two guys, they don't even care what they get, which is fine. But he said, you came here and you can't, you know, we, we talked about the history. I told him how far back I went one to five, six, six, five. So he said, you're going to have to really put up a lot of effort on this thing. So, and I mean, like if I was off 20 feet straight level, I'd be hearing about it. Just constantly, everything. When we started flying formation, you know, hey, settle down, the entire, right? Whatever. He just never stopped. He was on my back all the time. But what he was doing, he was forcing me to accept a very narrow margin of tolerance on everything I did. Well, we, we flew a lot of formation stuff, and I had a, a night formation sorting do on the T-38. And uh, so Chris put me up with a solo. Uh, and he put me up with the wing commander and the squadron commander, who both needed a night sorting to you know, get their currency, keep their currency up and everything. It's going to be a full moon, so Chris says, and the last flight, day flight we had, we were up there, and, and we, we were literally doing 90 degree wing overs, and I'm on the wing, and, and it, it, it sort of came natural to me, so it was, it, was, it was just fun. And he said, I want you to do exactly what we did the other day. I said, well, it's daytime. This is going to be night. This is the wing commander squadron. He said, if you don't come back and if their flight suits are soaking wet, I'm going to pick you on this ride. <laughs> well, okay. That's how I did. <laughs> anyway, I, well, I landed first. I walked into the, in the back of the squad room and Chris said, well, and how'd you go? I said, I did what you said. So I, I walked over to our table and pretty soon the doors opened and had double doors. I can still see the wing commander, full bird, colonel, and squadron commander, lieutenant colonel. Walk in and they stop. Right at the door. <laughs> squadron commander, he put his hands in his pockets. He looked at Chris. He looked at me. Looked back over at Chris. Did you put him up to that? Chris 
Oh no, Dave, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they said, night, 90 degree wing only? Where in the hell did you come up with that? I said, well, this is what I've told you, sir. So anyway, the bottom line is, Chris left me my last month of T-38 training to go to the Thunderbirds. So, you got a mentality there. Absolute perfection. So I go to, I get my 105 assignment, and uh, when I saw that I got that assignment, you could hurry all the way back to Magic Hall. I show up at Nellis, and the first thing I saw when I drove in the, in the, the gate was a big 105 sitting on a pedestal. Pull a big old grin got on my face. Uh, I, ch I check in, and we all get assigned to the instructor. Well, my instructor had a different uniform on. He was a Navy exchange pilot. And Harley H. Hall was his name. And so he taught me to fly the little fly, and he checked me out and everything. Well, another thing I talked about luck and who, who you associate with or who you uh, have a chance to work with or for. Harley later became. Blue Angel lead. So I had a couple of you can't hardly go wrong when you've got those two guys as your mentors, your they're the, the demanders of perfection. And, and I, I really did I learned to fly with that intensity. And and there is a level of intensity that is involved and you can like fly a 105 all day long, you know, and just fly. Or you can go out there and fly it with intensity and, and absolute perfection in everything you do with the airplane. The 105 was a, just an absolute awesome airplane, which very few people can comprehend this. But it actually was an airplane that you could wear. Now, this is the biggest single seat fighter, single engine fighter ever built. But you literally could wear that airplane. And you knew exactly. Or maybe I'll praise for it. I knew exactly what that bird was doing at, and at all times. And I had it through its complete uh, repertoire of uh, capabilities. I, I was also made to test pilot on the airplane later on. And uh, the airplane would tell you everything it's doing. I know that if, if any of you all ever have a chance to fly the 100 or anything, anything like that, it had a really a bad reputation of you know, if you got cross controls, I mean, it would. It, it would flip out on and everything else. And the 105 could do the same thing, but it would tell you exactly what it's doing. You could feel it in your, in your body. And it's just a tremendous airplane. And the fastest airplane in the world was a single engine airplane below 10,000 feet in the world. And I've had it pretty much right up there. And uh, so it was just a real treat to fly that airplane. We, uh, our class, you know, this is in the height of the Vietnam War, of course, and all the training was, I mean, it, it was it was probably as aggressive a training routine as, as anybody ever had, even in a, in a, a combat training uh, situation, because we were all going straight to war with that airplane. So they were really pushing us, and we were really, you know, uh, we were getting used to flying low and fast, and I can remember the flight lead taking us across the desert up there, and we'd be blowing rooster tails and dust up. And he could talk to us, pay attention, know where you are, start feeling comfortable. And we, we so it was some really, really aggressive training, and it paid off. Because it gets you in that mentality, and you, get, you really get comfortable with your airplane. Well, our old class wound up going to Yokota, which is in Japan, which was, where did that come from? It was the best thing that ever happened. Because what it did is, I got an extra six months under my belt flying the airplane, whereby I really got even more comfortable with the map machine. I really knew what it could do. And I had a mentor there, Bob Spielman was his name. Another lucky thing, because he was, he was our weapons officer. 
And we flew, we went up flying a lot together, and he let me do things that none of the other lieutenants were beginning to do. And he was letting me lead. As soon as we got away from the base, I was leading, because he, we weren't supposed, he wasn't supposed to be doing that. But, you know, for some reason or other, he, he trusted me, and uh, so I got, to, I got to step up a lot for my age at the time, or seniority, or my experience level. And uh, in fact, one time we were bringing a couple of airplanes back from uh, Osan. Of course, I was supposed to be number two on this wing. And we used to pull a nuke alert over at Osan. I'm sorry. Yeah, we kicked because you couldn't have nukes in Japan. That's what our main mission was, is back during the you know, Cold War days and all that stuff. We had nuke commitments and so forth. So we do pull it over at Osan. And we had two airplanes that needed to come back, and then they were going to take another two over there to rotate the airplanes. And so. I wasn't supposed to fly across country solo. Because we didn't, Brandy, we didn't, until you had so many hours. Of course, I didn't have that at this point. Well, we get ready to park, and uh, he goes down. He said, Dave, pick up airplane. They've got to get this airplane back. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the heat on it. And so I did. I'm halfway across, and this is, now we're coming in. It's going to be night, and it, it dark turn night. I have a complete electrical figure. And so I'm <laughs> there. I am trying to get. I'm, I get a little flashlight. I stick it up inside of my helmet. One of the little standby gauges over here on the side, which had a, it had a little attitude indicator. It had a heavy indicator. And uh, we did have uh, a nav where, whereby you could still navigate, but it was not very easy to see. So anyway, I brought the airplane in. So they said, "Well, where's where's the fields?" I said, "Well, he went down. You know, what's we back in?" Also, so anyway, that was an interesting experience. Well, I, when I got to the color, I had put in a volunteer statement for Southeast Asia because I knew we were all going to go and at some point time space, and so I put a volunteer statement in. And one day in uh, April 1967, they get a message from uh, Takali, which is one of the two F-105 bases in Southeast Asia. They uh, our airplanes were all based at, uh, in uh, uh, Thailand. We had two bases, Takali and Karat. They also had two or four bases there, Ulan and Udorn. And so we got all the five of us and went to Takali and got down there and uh, started flying sorties. And uh, the first thing, first they start you out with 10 easy sorties. Easy sorties were were in the lower part of North Vietnam. And so I did that, and, and we did have, have some Laos missions. I, actually, I got 105 missions in the F-105, 100 being a tour, uh, but I got five in Laos. So those didn't count as counters. Uh, but uh, I thought it was pretty cool to get 105 and 105. And so we, we get, I got my 10 and then started flying up into Hanoi. And you know, Everybody was talking about all the flak and MIGs and the sand and all this kind of stuff. And I just I started flying in May, I think it was, and yeah, it was quiet. No MIGs, no flak, no sand. I said, what's going on here? Uh, you know, I asked, you know, War Dodge was actually he was a major and I, he took me under his wing, he checked me out as a combat, you know, pilot. And uh, we talked about it. He said, I don't know, it was before you got here. I said, I even brought good luck. He said, I don't think so. And so it went pretty quiet there for a while, all the way up to July the 5th, 1967. And we're going in from the, we had two routes. Either we'd come in over Laos, or we'd go across South Vietnam, out of the water, refuel, and then come back up and come in from the east side. But we did the water route today, uh, on that particular day. And we were going against Kep Airfield, which is on the Northeast Railroad, about 35 clicks north of Hanoi. And like I said, it had been all nice and quiet. We get up there, and, and we were in the second flight. In fact, the guy leading us in, you may all be familiar, a lot of you guys might be familiar with this fellow, Bob White. He was, uh, he flew to Korea, and he was also one of the main test pilots on the X-15 program. At one time, he held the altitude and fastest man alive 
record. He went over 4,000 miles an hour in X-15. And he was the DO, the Deputy Director of Operations at, at uh, the Cockley, and he flew with our, our squadron 357. And anyway, he was leading the Force 10. And when we got there, started noticing these little puffs that I had seen before. I said, hmm. And uh, like I said, they were the first flight in, and we were second flight in. And you'd roll in basically as you're going in, you'd go in a staggered sort of formation like that, lead flight, second flight, third flight, fourth flight, and you'd be four airplanes per flight. And uh, on this mission, I think I was flying number two or number four, because it taught to lead. You, lieutenants were not allowed to lead. That was just uh, Scott. Uh, Bob Scott was the uh, wing commander, and that was his rule. Lieutenants were not allowed to lead, so you flew either two or four. And so I was, and I think that's number four, actually. And we roll in on the target, and I see, and I've never seen anything like this before. I still can see it in my brain, because these red streaks are going right by the airplane. And I said, that must be the flight that had gone off. And then the light bulb went on, oh wow, now we're finally getting shot at here. And I'm coming down the pipe. We, we basically, we do our bomb runs from start around 13, 14,000 feet and 45 degree bomb uh, or angle, doing about 550 on speed knots, and dropping bombs at about 7,000 feet because the 105 didn't have exactly the best turning radius in the world, so you, you'd want to pull out on both 4,000, which was a small arms fire. They were all the guys by the AKs and so forth. You want to stay above that stuff because they would saturate the bullet here. And so I'm going down to shoot, and all of a sudden, this jolt, Underneath me hits the airplane, and literally it it, it felt like who, who who's a big football guy player? It been behind you and just hit you as hard as he could with your, his hands. I mean, it just really was a, a, a real shot, and it completely rolled the airplane upside down. So here I am, doing 550 knots, headed for the ground, upside down, thinking I've been hit because of the way this whole thing went. I checked the gauges; all the gauges still were good, so I kept rolling, which is the best way to get around. And I checked the gauges again, and I said, I just continued on down, dropped the bombs, came off the target. And uh, as I came off, we rebriefed to come off the saddle. And I look up, and here's the 105 going through the sky, trailing fire 100 feet behind the airplane or whatever it was. And it was just all the whole fuselage was totally encapsulated in, in the <coughs> fire. I'd never seen anything like that. And so uh, I pull up alongside the guy, and he's got his nose real high. I can see his head smoke in the cockpit and everything. I said, drop your nose, drop your nose, you get too, too steep. And uh, he said, it's, it's, it's getting a little sloppy. And I, I, he said, I said, you bring it to the left, bring it left, and you're headed downtown. Let me get you to the water. And so he started easing over a little bit. And uh, his nose didn't get down enough. I said, lower your nose, lower your nose, you're going to stall out. So he dropped the nose, and the airplane started getting at this stuff. It wasn't happening. He got hit. The hydraulics were going out of the airplane, and he was losing it. And I said, don't let that thing tuck. Because the one thing the 105 was bad about is if you, were, if you had a high angle attack, and you lose your hydraulics, and it went catastrophically like that, all of a sudden it just dumped everything. The airplane would go boom, just like that, and then you try to clutch out, hanging on the straps, and that really would screw you up. And so I said, don't let the thing, you know, get out of it if you don't have to. Otherwise, I didn't talk to him. I just said, get out of the damn thing before it goes away from me. And so pretty soon, you know, the airplane just, you can see it just start just dance around him. So he punched out. And uh, I didn't know what it was. I knew it there in the first flight. I got back in, it was Ward Dodge. He was my mentor. And I took, uh, I've forgotten how many holes I had at the bottom of my airplane, but fortunately, they just penetrated the skin of the airplane. It didn't hurt the engine. So it, I, I did, I lucked out on that one. And uh, from then on, that was the routine. 
And uh, we lost a lot of guys up there. It is. And the sad part is we were hitting safe targets over and over and over. And, you know, it was pretty senseless, really. I, I, I probably hit the timing and steel plant five times. The first big raid on the timing and steel plant destroyed it. There was nothing there. But we kept getting tasked to go up there and hit the same targets over and over and over and get losing guys. Like I said, uh, by, by the way, I, I did write an article. Uh, I, I did a presentation out of Dobbins. And Colonel Todd Copley asked me if I would write an article. I've got this right here. This, this, this sort of describes a little something. You're welcome to have one. I got plenty of copies. And uh, so that's sort of <coughs> that, that was a turning point. Uh, in terms of how I approached everything, because it, it really got serious. And we were losing a lot of guys. And, uh, I flew 20 sorties in July, and I came back from my 20th sortie, and because everybody wants to get finished, they want to get their hunting missions in. And so I came back in, and I, my name lined up on the board, and uh, I said, "What's uh, how come I'm not on the schedule tomorrow?" And I said, "Well, you." Colonel Dugan said that you had uh, requested to, to be off and uh, to take some R&R. &R. I said, no, I, I don't. He, he must have talked about somebody else. And he said, well, that's what he told me. I said, well, no, he put me back on the He said, I can't do it. Colonel Dugan said, no. So I said, okay, I'm going to talk to Colonel Dugan. So I went back there and I, I told him my story. And he said, well, do you remember you, 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 said, you asked for R&R, &R, didn't you? And I said, no, that's somebody else. He said, Read my lips. You can sit here for the next week. You can go to Bangkok. You can go to Yukon. You can go to Australia. I don't care where you can go, but you're not going to get in a one fire. You've had enough this one month. And so I took all the way back to the code and had a blast. And all the new teachers had come in. And so life was good if you go to the bathroom. And I enjoyed that R&R &R very much. Came back down and kept on going. And then uh, I guess it was around the 10th of August, the original five guys, of which I was, we all got our orders to go back to Yokota, and another five were coming down. And I wanted to stay down and get my 100 missions, so I picked up the telephone, and my old squadron commander, when I checked out the F-105 at Nellis Air Force Base, had taken over a squadron at Korok. So I picked up the phone, I said, hey, Fox, this is the and I said, they're kicking me out of here and sent me back to Yokota. I said, I want to stay back and give my hundred. He said, get your blankety blank skinny ass over here. I'll take care of the paperwork. We're hurting for spirit drivers right now. So I packed my bags when I went to the garage, started flying. My paperwork never caught up with me. Yokota didn't know I was there. I was AWOL. <laughs> I was there. And they would have probably pulled me back. But on the 23rd of August, 1967, we were flying a mission, and there was a biggie. It was on the Yenden Railroad Yard, which is right across the Red River from Hanoi. And we had, it's such a big target that they actually added two F-4 found strike flights. Four each, remember. So, so it had eight F-4s along with the four flights of low fives going in on this target. Plus Robin Olds, whom I'm sure most of y'all, a lot of y'all know who Robin Olds uh, was. He was flying the mid-cap flight. So we start coming in the area and Big Eye starts talking about uh, Migs, fans, fans, pulls out. And that means they're taking off out of the Noy area. And be looking for them. So we're all looking you know, and so forth. And they call their vectors out. And they're actually vectoring west. We came in from the west side this, on this mission. And so they're vectoring out. And this is about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So the sun is over in the west. And what they were doing, they were positioning themselves to come out of the sun and come in on, on the force. And so uh, kept calling their position and Robin uh, says, we're looking for them, we're looking for them, and I can't remember who the force commander was, but anyway, he kept saying, Robin, you got to keep, get to find those guys. 
And he said, we're looking to do the best we can. And so we get going inbound. And sure enough, these two big 21s come in out of the sun, doing about 1.2 mock, and lost their ATOLs off. And they knocked two F4s down because they were buried back in the pack. And three beavers gone off because one of the guys didn't get out. When I guess the missile hit, it, unfortunately, he didn't ever get out of everyone. So we got all that going on. So Rob gets time up trying to take care of business and help these guys do whatever they can. And uh, so we keep, keep on trucking. And there's a bunch of big 17s all in the target area. And, but we, our job is to get this railroad going. And so that's what we do. And uh, so we went in, and right before. Right before I'm ready to roll in on the target, we have what's called, I one of my pictures, I don't know if it shows it or not, but it's called a reticle. And it's, it's you got, you got a windscreen just like this on the, you know, the front of your airplane. You're sitting here looking out through it. And then there's a, what they call it, a batting glass that sits, sits inside, and you've got a projector from uh, inside, behind the instrument panel that focuses up on that combining glass. And through that, you look and you see rings, with a pepper. And that's what you use to bomb with, to, uh, you know, if you're going to shoot airplanes or whatever you're going to do with it, that's what you use. And I had checked, I had probably as good a radar as there was. And by the way, the F 105 had the most sophisticated fire control system of any airplane flying in Vietnam. It was far beyond uh, the state of the art, it was, it was definitely one of the best. Well, when that bind all of a sudden went out, my bulb that actually projects the reticle on the combining glass went out. And I said, well, well, and I, I didn't have, we had a spare bulb, but didn't have a chance to get in there and, and do anything with it because, you know, we're about 30 seconds from rolling on the target. So I said, well, I've been there before. I, you know, I pretty much know the routine on that. So. Well, I rolled in, you know, I dropped the bombs and I come off the target and we had pre briefed to come off and turn hard north and rejoin the flight. So I'm in the process of turning hard north and I'm doing, now, I'm smoking along about 650 knots and I'm pulling about five, six G's. I, I kept my airplane moving all the time. I don't know whether that's why I was lucky enough not to ever get shot down out of whatever. Because uh, actually, when I left Parat, I had more missions over Hanoi than anybody faced. I had 49 right over Hanoi. And that's a lot of exposure, so I was just lucky. But anyway, I, I'm pulling hard to make sure that if somebody's tracking me, they're going to have to work at it. And as I'm pulling, I had to look up in the sky. I see this F 105 just going straight low. It's two MiG 17s right on his ass. And I mean, no more than 1,000, 1,500 feet behind him. The lead MiG is, is right behind him like this. This guy's going straight level. I, I assume he's at least going five or you know, more. And then the number two was off the right side, staggered back. And so I called out over radio 105, hit the west, you got two knees on the ass, do something. There was 2105s up there that day, so I, I, I didn't know who it was. And so I said, well, how about do something about this? And so I lit the afterburner, and I zero g the airplane, which you've taken off all the induced drag off of the airfoil. Now you're just your rocket ship going through the, through the air. And I had a sidewinder. A sidewinder is a heat-seeking missile. And they weren't the greatest in the world because they were old missiles. They really weren't the latest technology, but that's what we had. And you know, they, they got a lot of a lot of hits. But and I've got it and I start pulling up toward the pigs and I start getting this oral tone, which is how you know that the heat seeker is actually looking at a heat source. You get an R in your in your headset. And the stronger it is, the more, the more directly aligned you are. And so I'm getting it. And, and so that missile is sitting there, and here I am. I don't have a sight. There's two MiGs up there. That would definitely be the way to go. But then I look in front of that 
lead big. Here's this big old 105 with a J75 engine about four times larger than the MIGS engine. And I said, I don't know what this thing's looking at because they were so close. I, I didn't know. So I finally decided I, I, can't, I can't take the chance. I could have never lived with myself. So I reached over and turned the volume on the sidewalk down to get rid of that. And so I said, well, I just got to go in with a gun. And in the process of lighting the afterburner and zero G in the airplane, the last thing I saw when I found it, and I, I, I did that intentionally, they were, they were something like this right here. And I came in a little bit from, from this angle, about 7 o'clock, you know, going this direction on these guys. And I dropped my nose, though, so they wouldn't see me coming. So I came in low, which means with that zero G and descending slightly, I was accelerating like a bench. And uh, I looked at the last, pull, right when I got ready to make my pull on these MIGs, I was doing 1.3, which is about 850, 900 miles an hour or something like that. And it was smoking. And I come up and I don't have a sight, so I'm trying to figure what well, I This little bag was got off because I was now climbing and so forth and so on. I'm trying to figure out how to, where to start shooting. But then I realized how fast I'm going and how slow these guys are. I mean, my closure rate, and by the way, the old fire control system had a head to reticle, it would actually give you the closure rate on how fast you're coming at something. You'd have known it in a heartbeat, you could adjust everything. I didn't have that. So I, I decided I better go for the trailing big and try to just disrupt these guys. And so I, I went in on him, and like I said, I was, I was, I was going so fast. I opened up and raked and pulled to stay behind him, because you never, in an air-to-air -air engagement environment, you never want to get in front of somebody. Over to overshoot is what it would be. It would be like you're coming in like this, and you, then you're going too fast, you overshoot. Well, now he's, you just saw his problem. So I didn't want to do that, so I, I'm pulling about eight and a half G's to stay behind these guys, guys. and I went for vertical, and he's still going straight level because he didn't even know I was there until I, I opened up, and I didn't have a chance to see what happened to it. And I pulled vertical went up, straight up, with the bottom of a broken layer of clouds. And I'm sitting up upside down, just floating now, and I said, damn, you had one chance to get a big this thing, you blew it. And I'm sitting there, <laughs> It's just like this sheet of paper right here. And I'm, I'm on once, this is the cloud, I'm here, and out from underneath this, just like that picture right there, there's a big 17. This one's got his afterburner on. The other ones didn't have any burners going. I don't know where it came from, whether it was one of those guys or whatever, but he did not know I was there, and I just, I just pulled my nose down, rolled out, pressed in a little bit, and I opened up, and first bullets went right to the cockpit. I mean, I, I couldn't have bullet sighted it. You know, if, if I tried, I, I could have never done any better on that. And while I'm doing this, in some of these pictures, I don't really have a chance to look at some. These right here uh, actually were some of my gun pictures. And if you look at this one right here, there's a 105. He comes, he comes right between us when I'm actually on the trigger, hitting the mid. This 105 goes right between us. The big ball of fire comes out from behind him. And I didn't even realize he'd gone through it. Because I was so intense on this big. And uh, until we saw that that night when they ran the film back at the squatter, my eyes just got about that big. And I said, who in the world is that? But everybody got back. <laughs> and so, uh, that was the, the best part of the whole thing was that whoever this guy leading the two bigs around was a royal screw up because he should have never been flying like that, but he, everybody got home. And that's the best part of the whole story was the fact that, you know, I was able to get these bigs off of this tail and, uh, and, and our guys got home. And the F-4s, by the way, that what another one of their F-4s got hit over the target, so they lost three F-4s on that mission. And uh, that's, uh, that's another, the, the ones, the five of them were P.O. Douglas until the release in 1973. And, uh, but they did eventually all come back, except for that one guy who was, who was uh, 
the board that didn't make it out. And uh, so after that, you know, I got home, and you know, the first question everybody asked was, did he get out? And I had to answer no. And that's something a lot of people can't comprehend, is that even though we were on different sides and we were enemies, there's still a respect for uh, the other drivers. Because they were doing for their country the same thing that we were doing for our country. And we were told to go do our thing. They're told to do their thing. And so that's the one thing that still to this day I regret. I don't regret doing what I did because I saved the fellow 105 driver. I regret my sight went out because with the 105, it has such an accurate sight, especially when a guy's not maneuvering. Now, see, this guy was just straight level. Had he been maneuvering, all bets are off. But he was going straight level. I could have put the pepper on that airplane I was flying anywhere on that pig, and that's what I would hit because that thing was that accurate. And I've shot a lot of darts. In fact, I had I had the record for dart kills uh, in training at Yokota. And so I, I, I could fly the airplane, put the pepper on something, that's what I hit. But without the pepper, you can't do that. And so I would, the last thing I would have done was to go for the car. Right off the tank, the fuselage, the engine, you know, whatever, the wing. And it would take him out just as, just as quick. Especially with a, the cannon we used was a 6,000 round per minute, 20 millimeter cannon. And when it hits something, you're going to do some damage, big time. And so, but anyway, that's, that was one of the things that, that I, I always really regretted that it, that it worked out that way. But, you know, I did what I had to do. <coughs> Wouldn't change it. But, uh... <coughs> got back, and uh, that, was, that, was a, that was a pretty big deal. And that night, uh, Robin Owens called up, and he said, I want to know somebody's killed. Now, his language was, was a little different than the way I just put it. Robin was a character. I, I got to know him really well. And he called over and said, I want to speak to the intelligence officer. And we were, to, we were getting ready to start our big debrief. So, well, you know, we command from another base call so that was involved in the sort of just to come to the brief. You know, they, we put everything on hold, and so the intelligence officer goes in there, and Robin's on the phone, and he says, I want to confirm one of your blankety blank blank pilots kills over there. Here I am back there trying to get a spare solution on this MiG, this blankety blank 105, cuts in front of me and shoots it down. And he said, that would have been my fifth. I've been an ace. <laughs> and uh, that was a pretty big deal. And so then he started laughing. He said, it was the greatest thing I've ever seen. And I've got a letter from Robin uh, congratulating me on it and saying it was it was a highlight of his career watching a big old thud. He said it looked like a shark after a minute, which is how I got my call sign of the shark. Because when everybody read that letter, that's you know, what everybody started calling. And that's stuck even to this day. And uh, so anyway, uh, we, we wrapped that up and then, you know, the rest of the year was more of the same. We kept losing guys, getting shot down, and so forth. And I had experienced just about everything in this war that you could experience. And, um, but there was one thing that was left out. Well, I filled that square on October 28th. We're joining up with the tanker, and we're going downtown Hanoi. I mean, like two two miles outside of Hanoi, on the east side, southeast side of Hanoi. And we're turning, we've taken off, and real early in the morning, it's still totally dark outside. And we, you're you're looking to the east, and the sun starts coming up, and it's just like driving a car. You know, when you're looking at late in the afternoon or early in the morning, the sun's right now, you can't see anything in, probably on your, uh, in your car. And so it was the same deal. The sun had come up and said, you could, I'm, all I'm doing is flying. I'm flying number three. I'm looking at Lee to stay in position, and we're getting ready to join up the tankers. Well, we, we turn south now to join up with the tankers, and all of a sudden, as we roll out, I notice this big light on right here in front of me. It's, it's a master caution light. 
So I look over here on the, on the right side, there's like a telltale panel. It's got every single system that will turn that light on has a name over here and a light. Well, all low quantity was on. That's not a good thing. And I had taken off of the full back hole about three quarters of where we normally you wouldn't know, didn't want to have any less than three quarters a tank of oil. And so I called Lee and I said, Lee, I've got a master caution light oil quantity. He said, you think it's just a light? And I said, well, let me just watch it here so I can see what's happening. Well, it didn't take long on that quantity rather than being three quarters. It was, it, I mean, it had dropped to a half. And so that's what triggered the light. And sure enough, that oil quantity just kept right on going. And I said, hey, boss, I'm going to lose my oil according to this machine. He said, well, take it on in the you don't. If you can't take no four with you, it's a chase. So we peel off, and we're heading, heading that direction. And I keep watching it. And I'm loaded down with bombs. And we're, we're over tight. This is, this is our friend. So I didn't want to just unload all my stuff because there was, I could see a lot of little lights from houses and stuff like that on the ground where it was, because it was still dark down there. And so I didn't want to drop there, but there was a mountain ridge uh, a little ways away. So what I did is I started a big turn, just going to make a gentle turn and go over those mountains, thinking, you know, that would be pretty safe. And then I would just, I'd punch off all my ordnance, my tanks, and so forth. Because you want to get rid of all the weight. You know, you're trying to stretch something out, keep your power back, stretch it out, and get as much out of that engine as you can. So I want to get rid of this stuff. Well, about halfway in the turn, to get to these mountains, I start feeling this just this just this little vibration set in. And now my oil quantity is zero. And I check my oil pressure and it's following suit. It's also zero. So I told uh, number four, I said, hey, I've lost it all now. The quantity of oil is out. And he said, well just keep flying as long as you can, try to maybe maybe we'll make it. And I said, well, I'm already getting some vibration from it. And it was like you took a dial uh, and just slowly rotated that dial around the intensity of the vibration. It finally got so bad that as strong as the 105 was, and it was probably one of the most well-built fighters I think we've ever had. I mean, it was a strong machine. It would take a lot of damage, a lot of battle damage. F-4 Phantoms would never, ever take what the 105 would take. But it got so bad, I literally thought the tail of the airplane was going to separate. It was going to come off. It was just violent. And I couldn't even read anything on the instrument of the cockpit. It was just, it was just, it was just completely all over the place. So I said, this, this isn't going to work. So I, we had what's called a rat, a ram air turbine. You pull a little handle over here, and it flops out from the side of the airplane, and it has a little propeller on it, and it generates electricity and hydraulics to run your flight control system. So I popped the rat and I said, I'm shutting this thing off. And so I, I did, I shut it off. I'm a glider. Well, if you call it a rock a glider, that is, because it just comes straight down. It doesn't even you go anywhere. And uh, so I'm coming down and so at about 8,000 feet, it was time to go. So I reach down and pull up your handles. Let, you get these guards and it keeps your elbows <coughs> inside and then you've got the trigger that you squeeze, or either, either one. Squeeze the thing that can't be run off and bam, out <laughs> of that machine I went. And that's a hell of a ride. That thing accelerated, I, I think about 13 to 14 Gs is what you get. And it worked automatically, everything worked perfectly. Got the shoot, floated down, and uh, it, we, I, was, I had gotten over some, some pretty rough terrain at that time, and so I'm floating down this thing, and I said, well, there's a clear spot. I think I'll try to see if I can guide this thing. And I reached up to you, they always say, well, all you got to do is you pull on the riser, and the airplane will go that direction. It didn't do a thing. It just kept doing its thing. So I just went down, and I, did, I made a perfect 360-degree canopy over a tree, the very top of one of these tall trees there. It, that was it. I never, my feet, did, of course, didn't touch the ground. I just uh, stopped right there, and I'm sitting there for a little while. We had these, these jungle penetrators or the, that you, you can hook on to the uh, risers, and you lower yourself to the ground. I was so high up, I was afraid the darn thing wouldn't reach the ground. And so I, I decided, I'm going to think I'm going to climb down this tree. And so I did, and the only scratch I got out of the whole 
deal was when I got to about six feet in the ground, the tree was so big around I couldn't hold on and when I slid down, I stretched my whole my forearms. That's the only stretch I got on the whole thing. I went to fly the next day, in fact. I went went home and I shouldn't have, but uh, we were we'd lost some guys and so we were short for the schedule the next morning. And I told the boss, I said, you put me on a lower roof back commission, I'll go tomorrow. But I, I said, I don't want to go tomorrow. I just, it, my neck hurts too much. And so he did. That's why I flew the next day. Kept on flying. And uh, I finished up December 7th. Went back to Yukon. We lost about the thuds, I think I mentioned that. And so we got an F4s. Uh, so I went back to Stacy to check out the F4. And then came back in time for the Pueblo. And, Spend some time over there, and then uh, now I'm gonna tell a story of myself. I'm not very proud of, but all along through this whole thing, I, I had the opportunity to have to work with some fantastic leaders, uh, and that's this is one of the, one of my biggest regrets for our own country is that our politicians don't have to have some kind of military background because I guarantee you. We have a different state right now. I'm not going into politics, but I, I just the leadership that I experienced in the military, second none. The mentality, the work ethic, the demand for perfection, the demand to make to get the job done no matter what it takes, yeah, compared to other ways of doing business, uh, it is is really something. And I was very lucky to have worked with some tremendous leaders. And the next guy I'm gonna tell you about, <laughs> he gives you an example of it. Here I, can, I come back from Vietnam, and I, I wound up with all sorts of awards and, and distinguished background and so forth, especially as a lieutenant. Well, we checked out the F-4, and I had a back seater. Now, back then, the back seaters in the F-4 were pilots, and they were trying to build up the pool, the pilot pool. So they were putting them in the back seat. Well, I had a back seat pilot. So I were, and this was one of those days in you, if you come to the air base in Japan, you don't ever see. It's bluebird day. I mean, you can see for 40 miles. It, it, normally, it's a, if you see have three miles of visibility over there, you're lucky. Because it's, it's about 45 miles north and west of the north. I mean, of, of Tokyo. And so we're flying around. And this is just a local flight. You're coming. We're flying around. And I'm letting. Bob, in my back seat, would fly the airplane. And uh, so I'd come in, I'd shot a couple of touch and goes, and I'd let, I was letting him shoot some touch and goes, and he was, you know, doing some instrument stuff. And, well, the gear handle, the flaps, and all that stuff are all in the front cockpit, so he has to ask me for that. That's fine. So we're coming down finally, he asked me for the gear, put the gear down. And then he calls for flaps. I reach over and I'm not paying attention. I am looking around. I'm seeing things that I have never seen in your color ever. Well, the flap, is, the flap handle is, a, is sort of like a flat switch. And here's, here's Super Jock Dave is. And he's sitting up there and Bob calls for flaps. So I reach over and find a flat, a flat handle and I go, I blew the candy off. <laughs> and that was not a good thing to do. That was not a good thing. But I did, it, and so I declared emergency. I land. Of course, by then we've all got always got one of the, the colonels on call at all times with one of these radios. So I declared emergency. And taxi and just uh, now when the F4 canopy goes, it's got like a little little they call it an interlock lock. This, this, these two things are spring loaded to come together. When they're together, the seat is hot. It can be fired. The interlock block, which is attached to the canopy, keeps those little pins apart. Well, when that canopy went, there goes my little safety net. So I, I declare emergency, and they, they have to come up, see guys do, safety that seat, get it squared away. And uh, so I'm taxing up there. Here I am, thinking, oh my gosh, what can I say? What can I say? And so I get there, and here's Colonel A.K. McDonald in his little blue car with this little radio, waiting right there when I taxi in. Because, you know, he didn't have a clue what happened. Uh, nobody did that. So Bob in the back seat, he heard my vocabulary expended. 
rather judiciously. Uh, anyway, they get the seat thing done, and he hops up on the legs. Damn, what happened? I look at him, and I said, Colonel McDonald, I royally effed up. That's all I can say, sir. He looked at me. I said, I said, let me just get my stuff. We talked. We get back on the ground. And so, sure enough, you know, I get out of the airplane. I go down there, and I, I, I told him exactly what happened. He said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be raising hell and having your ass right now, and I can't do it. You screwed it all up by telling me you did it yourself. You didn't, you sure that it didn't just come off all of a sudden or something like that? I said, no, I'm loyal to screw it. And he said, okay. Uh, do you know better? I said, yes, sir. He said, consider yourself free. Travis. Uh, Basically, I was telling you you had five minutes left. That was a good question. <laughs> oh, that, that wrap it up? Okay. Well, anyway, the bottom line was, by that happening, and, and A.K. McDonald was one of those good leaders, uh, I'm over at Osan, we're pulling nuclear work. A.K. McDonald's over there also. This is about three months later or so. And I was... Since I was a bachelor, I was filling out my request for reassignment. And so I, I got to talking to him. And I said, how do you do something that's not on the, on the dream sheet? Because I said, I'd love to go ahead and get into what's the testing and evaluation. He said, well, just write it as a separate letter, uh, you know, just somewhere underneath there. And what I didn't know, and I got an assignment to Kirkland Air Force Base as a weapons research development test pilot. Well, I have an F-4 family and F-104 Starfighter, one of the best jobs in the Air Force. And I was uh, getting a check ride one time from one of the Stan of Allen guys, and he said, oh yeah, hey, you know A.K. McDonald, don't you? And I said, sure, he was the, he was the vice wing commander over to Yakota. He said, yeah, we got we to message him about you from, from him. What do you mean? He said, yeah, uh, back, I guess when you get your assignment, he called over here and, and talked to us and said, we need to hire him. And I thought that was a good example of leadership. I could have been, you know, really shot down my whole career, but instead, I was honest, of course, and he, he gave me the world. I guess uh, it's about time to wrap this up. And I could listen all day, but uh, I guess people would have to get on here. That's fine. That's fine. If any, if any of y'all are hanging around want to ask me questions, please do so. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.